All right. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back. Everyone who, who caught our first presentation, welcome to everyone who's just getting started with us. Um, my name is Bill McDowell, COO of Excellent Research. We are your hosts for this February uh, Virtual Insights Conference. Um, if you are just joining us, I'll just quickly go through our ground rules that we covered for, for, for the last presentation. Um, we are at the mercy of the tech. Uh, it wasn't a problem last time, don't anticipate it will be this time, but you know, on wood, um, Zoom has definitely been our friend uh, of late for these conferences. So you know, fingers crossed that, uh, that it'll stay that way. Um, second ground rule, uh, be respectful. You know, no, uh, no trolling in, in, in the comments section, but definitely do engage, interact, ask questions, um, submit any comments. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the q a if you're in the zoom um if you're accessing the another point uh youtube linkedin twitter uh we'll be keeping keeping an eye on all of that chatter as well um if you are using linkedin or twitter feel free to use the uh the hashtag arvic just to help us keep track of of any questions that are coming through um with that i am going to get out of the way and let Jason Jacobson kick us off with his talk, uh, which is titled Both Sides Now, The Importance of Having Both Client and Supplier Side Perspectives. Um, very excited about this one. I cannot stress enough the importance of it. So I'm going to, to get out of the way and let, let Jason do his thing. Stop Thanks, sharing, Bill. Jason, so you can. All right. All good, Bill, on seeing it? Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, depending on time zone, either good afternoon or good morning to everyone. I know it's always tough to find time to uh, you know, fit in a conference, but I really appreciate everyone taking the opportunity to listen in. And uh, you know, as Bill said, um, feel free to do comments and chats, and I'll, I'll try to you know, address anything as they, um, they come up, but probably do it towards the end of um, of the presentation. So one of the things that seems to come up time and time again, um, it's listed in the GRIT report, it seems, every year. It seems to be a, a topic that comes up just in, in, in conversation, is that there's really um, a gap between what buyers or sort of client-side researchers want and need and what suppliers are providing. And this is literally just from the latest GRIT report, there's a great quote, um, you guys can kind of read it, but they talk about this gap between the, um, in, in the relationship there. And um, I had spent, gosh, over 20 plus years on the um, supplier side um, in my career, working for various companies from some larger scale global companies like Miller Brown to some very small um, consulting type companies on the research side. And as much as being on the supplier side felt like I really understood what it was like to be a client and really understood what it was like to be in their shoes. Um, this past year, I came over to Woodside Homes and now I'm on the client side. And boy, it's a really, really different perspective. And I think having both perspectives now, like anything in life gives you a little bit of clarity. And there's some people that spend their entire careers on the supplier side. There's some people that spend their entire careers on the client side. There's some people like I am now that cross over. But I think really having both perspectives and seeing things through both lenses, just like everything else in life, I think leads to more powerful um, relationships. And, and what I found is that what happens on the supplier side and what happens on the client side, if you haven't sat in both of those, it's a little bit of a black box. Like you don't really totally know when um, a supplier is working for you, what's going on behind the scenes. And similarly, if you're a supplier and you're working with a client, you don't always know everything that's going on behind the scenes as well. So I'm hoping to give a little bit of insight into what's inside that black box. You know, in, in, in insights and research, I think one of the, the hottest things we talk about all the time is the importance of customer empathy, right? We need to feel what it's like to be in our customer's shoes, 
We need to understand their needs. And I think just as important, there needs to be some more empathy from the client and the supplier side perspective as well. And for us to kind of be in each other's shoes and again, to have some, some empathy and to really, really close that gap that the GRIT report and other things talk about. So let's uh, kind of in the, the spirit of empathy, let's try to have sort of both client and supplier side. Being a, uh, an insights person, I um, went and polled some people um, at, on both sides that I've had really strong relationships with and asked them, you know, what are some areas where you feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect? And um, seven topic areas came up, which I'm gonna go through each of them. They're research objectives, research proposals, uh, dashboards, reporting and insights, getting feedback, um, agile and speed, timing. And then if I have a little bit of time at the end, I think seven's always a good positive number, but I threw in an eighth one, which is uh, some general laundry list of, um, of areas. And, and just to kind of set the stage, the way that I'm gonna talk about each of these is starting with, for each of the areas, how does a supplier view this? What is their lens? What is their perspective? What are they really thinking about for that topic area? And then what does a client really feel like? What's their perspective? How are they viewing that insight and research topic area? And then over the past year, I've um, been very uh, grateful and thankful at Woodside Homes. I, I, I hopefully knock wood, they'll, they'll say it, have developed some really, really strong relationships um, with suppliers. And I think there are things that we did from both sides that led to success. So I'll use that um, as a little mini case study to talk through what are some of the things that we did to really, I think, help close the gap, have a successful relationship, and overcome some of the barriers and hurdles that we see for each of those major research areas. So starting first with um, research objectives. So research objectives, right? So if you're a supplier, you, you know, maybe it comes across in an RFP, maybe it just comes across in a general conversation with an existing client and you see those words objectives, you generally get pretty excited about it, but you also tend to take a pretty narrow view of, of research objectives because you're thinking about how do I scope this research engagement? How do I price it? Um, you sometimes start thinking methodology, maybe get excited about, wow, maybe there's something really creative that I can do to address this, or maybe there's something more traditional. You start thinking about how do I either build a, a survey or how do I build a mod guide? Like what are the questions that I need to ask? And you do think about a little bit of the end of like, what are the insights that this client really wants? They've given me these objectives. Um, and, and how do I start to think about how I'm gonna build something to get the information that they need? And, and it's a bit of a generalization, but I think it, 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 when a supplier thinks about those objectives, just given the nature of their work, they tend to go to that place. On the client side though, we think about objectives in that way, but we also take a, a much broader view of, a, of objectives as well. So when we think objectives, we think about who, what stakeholder in my organization is really needing this information? Is it the CMO? Is it someone in product? Is it someone in design? Based off of the insights in the research, what sort of decisions do they really need to make? What information do they need? What actions do they need to take? Um, you know, a, a hot button word is jobs to be done. We use that a lot internally here of thinking about at the end of the day with this research, you know, what's the jobs to be done? What's the information that we need to make key decisions? Um, we think about how do these results need to be packaged? We've got some people here where they need a, a really large deck, lots of information, lots of data. And we've got some people at the executive level where we need to give them a prepackaged, two page visual, just the decisions. And we're thinking about sort of some of those trade offs. Um, Oftentimes we need to think about how does this specific research effort fit within our larger re uh, research ecosystem? So is this just a one-off research study and a set of objectives, or is it sort of filling the gaps in some other things that we're already doing? Um, we think about what does success look like because our role is to really communicate 
and help our end stakeholders make decisions. So we're thinking about sort of even further down the line than just the specific research study. And I think one of the things that happens on the supplier side too, is that you tend to think a little bit more methods and you're thinking about scales and approach. And on the client side, yes, we're concerned about that, but I think we're, we're a little bit, sometimes a little bit more open maybe to the type of approach. And it's more just, we wanna have real strong confidence in that whatever the approach is and whether it's a three point scale or a five point scale or it's qualitative or it's quantitative, that we're just really answering the key issues. And there's oftentimes a little bit more openness in the, um, the approach with just having confidence that we're gonna to get to the information that's ultimately needed by our stakeholders. We um, work with a, um, a really great supplier for the first time here at Woodside Homes. And um, the, the whole engagement was very positive. And I think one of the things, you know, setting up research for success that we did that I think led to a successful engagement and kind of closed the gap on understanding objectives is um, like a lot of people do, we had a kickoff meeting, but we, it was a bit more expansive than maybe a normal kickoff meeting. We actually um, brought in um, our marketing stakeholders to that meeting. And as much as we had really standard research objectives, we had the end stakeholder talk about what their needs are. I think it was really important. They just kind of talked in their own words, um, let them sort of run off unfiltered. And I think it gave the supplier a really good perspective on what we're trying to get to because sometimes that gets a little bit filtered and we don't let our stakeholders speak. We did that here and it was really helpful for the supplier to understand what were their needs. Um, even though we started with a set of objectives after that meeting, we workshopped it and we came down to three key objectives that we all agreed on. So even though we started with those, we let them have some back and forth and then we came to some mutual agreement. We showed how the research effort really fit. I, I use this word ecosystem because it was important. This wasn't just a one-off. This research needed to fit within some larger things that we were doing. So we gave them some insight into where that fit. You know, I think it's used, you know, starting with the end in mind, we started with at the end of the day, we need our research to tell us X, Y, Z. And we were really clear on that with them. And we came to some mutual agreement on the scope and the methods. So it was a very collaborative effort. Um, and it ended up being really successful because we just, I think, took some of these extra measures to really hone in on what the research objectives were. The next one um, I'll talk about is research proposals. So our, you know, kind of like a standard RFP, if you're a supplier and you get an RFP, it's like a woohoo, all right, this is great. You know, an RFP came through, there's a level of excitement, you get this opportunity to, you know, maybe have some new work, um, really show off your skill set. Um, you know, it, it tends to raise the energy for everyone in the company. Um, there's often time to sort of dig into the, the proposal and immediately start to create a framework what I found is sometimes there's this a desire to really focus on like as a supplier, who is your team and what do you bring to the table? Maybe a little bit less on the method. Um, and, and sometimes on the supplier side, you get an RFP and there's this almost this assumption that, well, the client put it together. They really thought about all the issues. So I don't think I'm going to ask that many questions. Um, or they assume that, you know, as a client, we're really busy and we don't want to be bothered and they don't always take the extra step of asking some questions. Um, know that any proposal that's put together on the supplier side takes an incredible amount of time, effort and investment unpaid for. And, you know, you have to set aside time. You have, it's a lot of hours. It sometimes takes more effort than a research report to put that together. Um, I found on the supplier side, you can be really, really focused on price because you're trying to win and you think price can be sort of the, you know, one of the things that tips it. There's always this opportunity you want to present in person. Yes, it's great to, you know, send over via email, but the opportunity to, you know, let's call it Zoom in person nowadays and really walk through your rationale. I think what happens with proposals, sometimes they go into this ether and you send it off and there's this black box and there's this radio silence and and, and boy, you know, you put in all that time and effort and if you're not selected, it can be really, really hard. Um, and sometimes it's actually okay because maybe it's not a good fit. On the client side, 
you know, we, we worked on a few RFPs. It's an incredible amount of work as well, just putting the RFP together, figuring out what's the research scope, what are the objectives, what are our business goals, and, um, and when you put it all together, it's like, oh gosh, now I've got to find time to answer questions and review proposals and set up calls. So um, it's, it's a lot of time and investment on the client side as well. And one of the things that I found on this side of the table is that we really want a partner to be successful. So um, when we send out an RFP, there's a sort of this expectation that whoever we're sending it to we're going to select somebody, but we want you to be successful because if you're successful, we're successful. And um, we get, a, I've seen a lot of proposals that are so focused on the team or the supplier or the company or their background. And they spend a lot of slides and a lot of time and energy, but we've kind of already selected you. So we have a little bit of um, knowledge and, and some confidence in, in the ability to do the work. And their proposals aren't often as focused on what are the end results and who's going the extra mile? I really, uh, sitting on the client side, like it when suppliers want to set up a phone call, want to talk through the proposal, show some extra interest, want to bounce questions off. I, I, now that I've been in this position for several um, research engagements, we got some amazing, amazing proposals and it was really, really tough to make a decision. Um, and in, in some that I thought would win were not selected. And sometimes here, a CMO just said, I like that one better. <laughs> so that, that does happen. So sometimes, you know, like from the supplier side, you could do everything right and still not win it because one of the decision makers just says, well, you know, I like that one better. Um, and I think on the client side, unfortunately, sometimes after this whole RFP process, there's not a lot of follow-up with suppliers the way that there should be, especially for ones that don't win or when a proposal gets put on hold. And what I found on this side too, while price is such an issue on the supplier side, or we think it is, it isn't always on the client side. Yes, price matters, but we also have a budget. And sometimes we actually need to have research engagements that might be a little bit higher in dollar scope to justify our budget and to keep it for, for years on end. So there's a tricky thing with price that um, kind of comes up on a case-by-case on a -case basis. We um, had a, um, we've had a couple of, of really large um, engagements here from a, an RFP and proposal perspective as Woodside Homes, we're going through lots of new initiatives. And one of the things for um, our most recent one that I think really helped again, kind of close the gap is that um, one of the vendors that we selected, they um, set up some phone calls to talk through our needs. They showed an incredible amount of personal interest in the research, which really felt like, wow, they, they really care and they really wanna work with us. Their proposal in contrast to some of the others that we got, um, got right to the point. It was very personalized. It was very focused on the end research needs. It was less focused for them on, on their team. It was more about what they're gonna do, how they're gonna solve our problems and why their approach works and why it's right. What we did on our side is we really coached them. Yes, we gave them the proposal, but we said, if you do this, this will help you succeed. So we tried to really guide them in the proposal for success, because again, their success leads to our success on both sides. And then once we did a, a selection, at least what I did is followed up with each of the suppliers. It, it was very hard conversations, you know, to say that they weren't selected, but I think there was, you know, again, some empathy of acknowledging the work that they put forth and that there's gonna be other opportunities and talk through the selection process. So they just weren't left there kind of in the ether with, with um, radio silence. And I think it's helped kind of keep some really good relationships going because we have used some of these other vendors for some other opportunities. The next one is um, dashboards. I call this dashboard, new technology, AI, machine learning. Uh, gosh, on the, on the supplier side, there are so many companies right now offering dashboards. And when you're a supplier, you're excited. You've got a new dashboard or a new way of showing data or you're showing decision-ready insights. And 
you know, you come across, well, this dashboard or this technology is going to save you time and money and effort, and it's going to be value added. And they use the word, it's going to democratize your data. And, and we have a subscription and, and probably like a lot of people now sitting on the client side, you know, I get inundated with emails about this and, and some are personalized and, and some are just completely cans. Um, some are just selling the technology, um, but they're not selling the solution. The ones that do this better are selling the solution and how it, how it really helps solve issues. Sitting now on the client side, when I was on the supplier side and we came up with new dashboards and new technology, you know, I had this level of excitement. I always thought, gosh, how, how is a client not going to sign up and take this? Sitting on the client side though, we are drowning in data. <laughs> um, it's almost too much data at times. We have so many dashboards already and sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, another dashboard. Um, some of these dashboards are great and they help me make decisions. Um, but it's, it, it's hard. It takes time and energy and effort to learn a new dashboard, to figure out how that data is going to fit into your ecosystem. Um, if there is a new technology or a new solution, it isn't just a simple sign-up process. Internally, we have to make the business case that we want to invest in this and this is why. Um, we need to demonstrate that there's some return on investment. Um, you know, it's very hard to sign up for a dashboard or a new technology for an entire year um, if we haven't seen it and if we haven't experienced it and give that full commitment because that is a big investment. Um, and what I found with, you know, new technology and dashboards is some of them just don't tell a story. They are maybe overly complicated or these some really cool things and have some great bells and whistles. Um, but they oftentimes aren't action oriented or they don't tell a story. And so we are working with um, actually three, let's call them sort of dashboards, um, SaaS type systems. Um, and we signed up for them and they've been really successful, but we did some extra things. One is on their side is they did some personal reach outs. They really understood what our business needs and some of the challenges were. They gave us a trial subscription, which was fantastic. They said, try it for a quarter. We paid for a quarter, use it, see if it works. And at the end of the quarter, if you don't like it, you can stop the contract. But if you like it, then you can commit to a year, which was much easier internally here to get management on board to get a new technology and a new system in place. Um, what but all three of these um, providers did is they really helped us get onboarded. You know, they, they set up time, they have an internal team that help us start using their data. Um, they did a lot of um, learning and tutorials. So immediately they got us engaged and took some of the barriers away. Prior to selling in, we gave them our data and they used it as a case example. So we really got to see that information and see it in use and sort of just buying the catalog. We bought what, it actually was going to do for us using our data. Two of them have some APIs with our current system, which makes it super easy. Um, and one of the things about the dashboards um, that are really unique about these three is that it's not just data. It, it has um, actions. It, it really gives some very good clarity and indicators and it provides recommendations and it tells a story. So these dashboards aren't just sitting there. We're not just running things and kind of looking for information. They are identifying areas that we either need to improve on or they're saying, hey, this is an issue. We need to go look further into this. And they really shine and they've taken dashboards and taking them to the next step, which from the client is really, really useful and has helped in a, a very successful engagement. The next issue is reporting and insights. So, um, you know, from a supplier side, um, you know, when you put a, a report or an insights deck together, you know, that, that's really your opportunity to demonstrate your value. It's your, you know, it's the end result. It's, you know, what we're paying for. It's obviously the intellectual capital and the partnership and the things that go into it ahead of time. But at the end of the day, that report is, you know, it's your deliverable. Um, oftentimes on the supplier side, it's the fun part, you know, digging in, 
producing something that you can, you know, put your your brand and your stamp behind is often where you feel a lot of pride. Sometimes there's just a desire to um, do too much and you want to show all of your work and produce this big deck or this big appendix. You really want to make something super visually appealing and compelling. Um, and you try to sort of balance this all, you know, how do you tell a story versus showing the data and having the information. Um, and what I found on the supplier side, sometimes you kind of have what you think is the end deliverable in mind, but you don't always know what that is. And sometimes there's a mismatch in what you produce. From the client side, from the reporting and the insights, what we're really trying to do is make this packaged into a digestible format. It needs to be compelling. We are dealing with stakeholders who sometimes only have 10 minutes, sometimes only have 30 minutes, and we need to figure out how are we going to get this information in a way that just gets them to implications and what decisions they should make. More is not always better. Um, even though great, getting great decks is fantastic, oftentimes most of that stuff is moved to the appendix, or it's fine to see tabs, or it's fine just to see the data behind the scenes. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to do here is, as, as much as it's great to see a number, as much as it's great to see a percentage, as much as it's even great to see a quote, bringing that research to life and humanizing it with video and with emotion really, really connects with our end stakeholders, and sometimes that's what they take away. Um, even though the data might be tell you one story from the supplier side, from the client side, there's oftentimes some internal politics and we might need to kind of, uh, you know, make the story work in a certain way. So instead of, sometimes we need to be super directive, sometimes because internal politics, we just need to be more descriptive to make sure that we're not maybe, you know, um, saying something that's against what somebody else internally thinks about. And I think ultimately with um, reporting and insights on the client side, what we really want our insights department is, is to be at the beginning of the value chain. And we want our internal stakeholders to lead their meetings with our research says, our research says this, our research says this, therefore we do this. And the more that a supplier can help us get to that point, the more successful that I think we're going to be from a reporting and insights perspective. So it's less about the data, and it's even sometimes less about the story, and it's more about the decisions and, and, and the action and the directions that we're giving our stakeholders. And we um, are just wrapping up an engagement with a really incredible um, vendor who um, just actually presented to um, two of our high-level executives. And there were some things that really, really led that, that end report to success. One is on their side, they um, set the stage for like why we were doing this research. They gave a little bit of credibility for the why behind their results. Um, they provided information in a 10 page deck. It was digestible, it was easy to follow. It had um, very clear directions, moved everything else into the appendix. Um, it was very decision focused, not data focused. And what really helped is we had a lot of check-ins with their team. So before they ever produced this deck, we had about four check-ins and kept evolving it together as a team. So we kind of got to a place where we knew what our end stakeholders needed and we really helped them evolve the deck to meet that. They used video in a very compelling way. Um, it really connected with our end stakeholders. It brought the voice of the research to life. And it was interesting. I've seen some very slick reporting decks. Theirs wasn't super slick. And, and it's, not a, it's not to say that that's a downside of things. It was fine. It was clear. It had a lot of white space. It didn't have some, sometimes I see these reports with so many bells and whistles and so many visuals that it takes away from the data. Theirs was, was nice but our end stakeholders just appreciate a little bit more of the kind of the simplicity and the, and the direction behind it. Next one, getting feedback. Okay, so on the supplier side, whether you know you produce a survey, a moderator guide or a report, um, you put so much time into putting these deliverables 
You want to turn things around quickly. You're doing your best to make sure that these deliverables are client ready. You want to get it right. You want to impress it. And you get that email, right? Of, oh my gosh, there's comments. And there's this fear of opening up the, the PowerPoint deck or the Word doc and seeing strike throughs and, and, and comments. And then you're like disappointed that you didn't hit um, the mark and, and you don't always have visibility and gosh, why were all these changes um, there? But there's also this willingness to like do whatever it takes to make it right. And I think sometimes there's this either need or desire, depending on the extensiveness of the feedback, to maybe push back a little bit. And I think that's okay. But you know, feedback in general in life can be hard, right? Um, getting feedback on your deliverables, sometimes you sort of need to take that breath and get to a good place um, and, and never kind of take it personal um, and take it in the right spirit because. You know, what I found on being on the client side with the feedback is we don't always know what we want. <laughs> I wish we did. I wish we had a crystal ball. But until we see it, um, then we're able to give feedback and react to it. And sometimes what will happen is like in, in being on this side, we'll have a questionnaire. We'll have a mod guide. We'll even have a report. And then somebody higher up looks at it and just blows it up <laughs> and says, I want a completely different thing. And, and that's gonna happen. And we have to sort of take this and then make the, the augmentations and the edits to it. Sometimes on the client side, we just don't provide the right clarity. We think we're clear, but we're not providing the right direction. Sometimes um, from the time the supplier started working on the deliverable to several weeks down the road, things change um, and we need to account for that. And I think just know that hopefully for most clients when they're giving feedback, it's in the spirit of success. And it's the spirit of let's get this right. Let's work through this together. It's not that anything was done wrong, um, but give some background on maybe why the changes were there. We know our stakeholders best. Um, and just know from us, it's also okay to push back. If this is pushing something out of scope, if this is beyond what's expected, um, you don't just have to take like what we are word for it. I think if there's a true partnership and a true relationship there, there there's going to be some give and take on feedback. And um, one of the things with um, one of the suppliers or the one that actually did our, the report deliverable that I was talking about um, that led to a very successful sort of feedback system is um, they asked a lot of questions up front prior to every deliverable. They, one of the questions they asked that I think was fantastic. They said, um, they posed this open-ended question. This would be great if your report did the following. And they asked this open-ended question and we talked through it. So they made sure that the report hit that mark. Um, they, we really talked through who are end stakeholders, how did they learn? Um, tried to be really clear in our business situation. We set expectations about the deliverables. So one of the things that we did here is we didn't expect things to be final. Um, and we did brainstorm sessions. We saw outlines, we saw early drafts. And yes, there was more time on our side from the client side, probably some a little bit more time on the supplier side, but seeing things early and evolving them together help with that feedback cycle. So it wasn't saying, oh, this was off. We knew where things were the entire time and just kept moving it along together. And I think it was okay. We said, look, I know this is gonna be early. I know this is gonna be rough. I'd rather see it in that format before the final format so we can make changes along the way. And um, it was just a much more sort of, you know, collaborative session that got there. And again, I think sometimes on the supplier side, you just want to show your beautiful end result. And I think it's okay to be dirty <laughs> and it's okay to show drafts. And I think that gets you to that better space at the end. So you're, you're all on the same page. Um, agility and speed, right? There, there's so much talk on the uh, on a lot of supplier side. Faster is better. It's better to provide bite-sized information. Everyone needs to keep a pulse. You know, agile research is great. It could be less expensive. And yes, yes, yes to all those things. And from the client side, because I get you know inundated with this, you know, sort of types of requests um, from suppliers to sort of have this type of research. It works well for specific types of situations. We're doing iterative design. We're doing some um, design changes here. Works great there. Um, 
When we have a couple quick questions we just need an answer to, works great. Um, we have some ongoing quick pulse studies, works great. Um, but the one thing with agile, fast research is on the client side, just know that we also need to be mindful that um, the sample is good. We have some hard to reach audiences here at Woodside Homes trying to find home buyers and people in the market. So even doing things, we can't do things super fast sometimes because the sample could be a little bit tricky and we need to have some flexibility in the question types. Even when research is done fast, it still takes some time to analyze it. And one of the things I've really learned on the client side is more and fast isn't always better. It is at times, but it takes time to institutionalize research. We can only feed our internal stakeholders so much and we need to be sort of mindful about when we deliver information so it has the most impact and so we don't overwhelm people. So I think the big thing is just agile research works, but it needs to sort of fit the right situation. And it also, when it comes across, it needs to align with our other findings. Because if we do something quick and fast and it's disparate or it's divergent and something that we've seen before, there, there could be some issues there. So just sort of, I think, be mindful of kind of those um, perspectives. And, and we're working with um, um, a provider that we do a lot of sort of, iter not a lot, but a fair amount of iterative work with them. But one of the things that makes that successful is we have a lot of control over the sample. Their system's easy to program. There's a lot of flexibility in the question types. The output is really, really easy to understand. It's low cost video. And on their side, um, they really provide great customer service in terms of helping us use the platform, turn things around and, and turn things around quickly. So the last sort of big one is, is timing. And um, so from a, a supplier side, you know, we, there's a lot of urgency in, in, in trying to get things over the finish line, whether it's sign a, um, a contract, whether it's win a project. Um, you know, the, um, I have a lot of empathy for you know, business development, salespeople. You're making projections. You're trying to say, what are you gonna be this quarter? You're making commitments way up the, the, the chain. You're trying to qualify leads. Like, is this somebody I should follow up with? Is this a hot lead? Do they really have budget? Do I need to spend my time with them? Um, internally, you're trying to manage your staffing and workload and, and have some forecast and projections. And um, some suppliers can be pretty pushy on this. Um, and some can be great with, with just the check-ins. But just kind of, I think, on the supplier side, understand timing has an incredible amount of importance and it impacts so many things at the business. On the flip side, on the client side, we oftentimes have less urgency. Um, Sometimes things need to move quick and we can do so, but oftentimes in order to sign up for something or get a research study across the finish line, we need to make a business case internally for that investment. We need to show the ROI. Our budget cycles vary. Like one quarter, some things could be put on hold. The next quarter, the floodgates can open up. We could be at the end of the year where we have um, extra money. What one project might be a priority and we think that it's going to go and then another project comes in and all of a sudden it has higher priority and we have to juggle and move things around. Um, oftentimes we, you know, to make a decision, it's got to pass through legal. It's got to get approval from multiple stakeholders. And I would say check-ins are okay, but um, pushing it, it is not and kind of can fracture some, um, some relationships. And we've, um, we've onboarded a, a couple of um, su suppliers. And one of the things I tried to be really respectful of is, is the transparency on timing. So they were transparent that they were trying to do some projections. Here was the end of their quarter. And, and we were really um, upfront about how long this was gonna take to make a decision. Um, we gave them what we need to make the business case. So in order to um, invest in this research, we need X, Y, and Z. And they provided that information to us, which really helped us internally build um, the business case. We talked through different barriers that um, needed to happen in order to move forward. And then they showed some flexibility in their terms too. So, um, you know, timing's one of those kind of crunchy things. And I think, again, just sort of, you know, more transparency on both sides, it's led to success for us. 
I thought I would just leave with a little bit of a, of a barrage of uh, kind of bonus round things that just things that were sort of, I, I kind of come up and have, you know, sort of percolated in my nearly 25 years in the industry and seeing how things have evolved and and just having some conversations about this presentation with a few others. So some, some maybe tidbits for suppliers, depending on if you're out there. Um, sort of my wish list of things is there is so much focus now on customer empathy and emotion and qualitative information, but it's hard to put that all together in a digestible way. You, going through videos, even when you could do snippets, even when you could do themes, it's tough to put that all together and make that super strategic. So if there's suppliers out there that can help with that qualitative humanizing in a more strategic way, um, I think that's a, a need out there. Um, we need to just really get our behavioral science down. Um, yes, surveys are great, but the more actionable information comes from understanding consumers in context, from understanding emotions and understanding motivations and what drives their decisions. And there's some great neuroscience going on um, out there, but evolving our measurement system is gonna help us be more predictive and I think help suppliers produce better results. I think um, CX and UX and branding, sometimes those areas, and I get it, are very disparate, but I think they can be maybe viewed a little bit more holistically because at the end of the day, they all sort of get to a place of understanding consumers um, in leading to insights. And sometimes UX and CX are, are disparate, but there's a lot of crossover there. So it'd be great to see those groups coalesce and work together a little bit more. Um, being on the, the client side, I get canned emails all the time for those salespeople out there. It's great when something's personal. Whenever somebody sends me a personal email and they've taken the time to maybe learn more about what my business needs are, I will reply. When something's canned or it's, you know, it's clear that they don't haven't taken some extra energy, generally I think a client's not gonna reply and just added a few other things I think um, in, in terms of um, there's a lot going on with AI and machine learning. And what I would say with all these kind of things at the end here is don't sell the technology, sell the solution. Sell what your technology is going to do for a client and how it's going to make the decisions because words like AI and machine learning and text analytics um, don't get us where we need to go. That's the engine, but focus on the solutions and focus on the actions and the decisions that we're going to be able to make based off of that information. Sorry, I'm a little bit on my uh, uh, on a high horse here, so apologies for that. But uh, on the client side, I think the things that we can do is really be much more clear with suppliers on what our desired outcomes are. I think sometimes we think that we're clear, or we put an RFP together, um, or we put out their objectives, but we're not clear enough. Um, I think it's important to talk about where insight sits in the organization. Is it mature? Is it new? Um, where does it sit in the value chain to help suppliers have a better perspective on what sort of information they need to provide? Um, just being open and honest about some of the barriers that it's going to take for research to go into the organization. Um, again, just being transparent, providing more timely feedback. Um, and one of the things that I've seen on the client side is, is regardless of the, what the supplier does, whether they win a project or not, is say thank you and be appreciative. I know it's a simple thing, but sometimes that goes a long way to, um, to building relationships. It's just being appreciative of the work um, and, and taking that extra step. And, you know, kind of my four summary points here is um, in terms of the visual is I think more collaboration is needed between suppliers and clients because we're gonna get to end results better you know, putting each other's shoes, having more empathy, having more understanding. Um, again, I sort of hit this point of don't sell the technology, think about the solution and let's get there and let's start with the end in mind. And I think that's one thing on the client side that we could be clearer is where does this need to be? What are the actions that we need to take? And let's really get the information there and be more clear there. And I think that'll all help close the gap. So with that, I really thank you for your time. I will um, turn this over to Bill and see uh, if there's any sort of questions. All right. 
Any questions, go ahead and submit them now for Jason. Um, Checking to see if any have come through. And while we wait on that, uh, you know, I, the term partnership is one that everybody likes to, to throw around in, in the research world. Um, but it, you know, it's true. <laughs> you know, the things that you've described, um, you know, this sort of empathy, openness, communication, you know, oftentimes we do take this like, you know, seller and selly approach and it becomes, you know, adversarial at times. Um, but no, to the extent that you can sort of, you know, be open with one another, ask questions, show those vulnerabilities, it, it, it tends to help tremendously. Yeah, no, completely agreed. And I think that's just, again, I kind of opening up that black box a bit helps. And, and I think overcoming from the supplier side, overcoming the need to be perfect. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's really helped. And again, from the client side, giving more visibility. I think those are the kind of the two areas where I see those sticking points on the supplier saying, look, this is a rough draft. This is my outline, but I wanna make sure that I'm hitting the mark. And from the client side saying, that's great. Yeah, it's gonna take me a little bit extra time, but let me review that because I think what happens is things are delivered too much oftentimes in like what's quote unquote the final stage. And you've got this mismatch of, of expectations and that's where, you know, you can get some of that butting of heads or a little bit of that, um, yeah, <laughs> that happens. Um, oh, we had a great question coming in from, from Andrew. Do you also feel it's important to follow up after the research has been delivered and share how the research was used and the outcomes? Yeah, black box. yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that was one of the things on the supplier side that I always felt is like, we produced this report, we gave direction and oh my gosh, what happened? And then you're waiting to see like, did, did, did that ad that we tested come through or did that product come through? And, and yes, and I think what I've been trying to do on this side is follow up with, you know, you recommended X, Y, Z, here's where we're at, or here's where we're at in the development cycle, or we decided to do X, Y, Z, but here's why. And I think that gives some greater understanding. And I think that's a great area to, again, sort of keep the conversation going. What I found on the supplier side is great at the end to do, you know, almost like your grand rounds of your business case, like what did we recommend, but then follow up with the client or vice versa, and then talk through what did you end up doing with the research? What sort of decisions? And it, and it could be something where, you know, nothing happened because of you know, internal budget, things got stalled or things got delayed or, you know, that was such a great insight. And here's some of the things that we did based off of it. And I think from the supplier, it's great to hear that, right? Because you're like, wow, my work had value <laughs> and I did something. And from the client side, again, sort of, it, it helps keep evolving that relationship. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's all about relationships. Um, and like any relationship, it requires work and effort and, you know, you can't do it on every single engagement. Sometimes yeah. you're up to your eyeballs and you just can't circle back and, and share those results. Um, but to your point, you know, attempting to is always a good thing. Um, I know we've got a lot of young researchers that are, that are in attendance. Um, and I know when you're just getting started in your career, you don't necessarily get to pick and choose. You, you get that foot in the door wherever you can, corporate side, supplier side, you name it. But, you know, it, I love the topic and I love that you've you know spent time talking about it because I do feel like it is such an important thing to, you know, if you're mapping out that that insights career, being able to spend some time on, on both sides of the fence, it just it, it helps so tremendously. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think on the supplier side, you, you know, you you learn how research gets done. I think, and that's the important thing. You learn how to trade off methods. You learn, you know, sort of sample efficacy. You know, you um, you get into the weeds, which I think is really, really critical, as well as you know, telling a story. You know, uh, and on the client side, what you really learn is how to package research 
to help your stakeholders make decisions. And it's a very, very different lens, but they're so incredibly important. So I would say to young researchers, you know, like I said, I started off on the supplier side, I'm on the client side, I've seen people do the reverse, but if you have the opportunity to kind of, you know, dip your toe in, in both waters, great. If you really like one track on this, the supplier side, what I would say is ask these more probing questions of your client, like who are the stakeholders? Um, how does this research fit? Is this a one-off to give you greater sort of empathy and understanding what decisions need to get made? And if you're on the client side and you just wanna be there, immerse yourself in some methods, you know, or ask your supplier, you know, you recommended X, Y, Z, why'd you do that? You know, what were some of the things that you traded off, I think to get a little bit understanding more at the, the sheer methodological level. No, and you alluded to some of this, and it sounds like even in your, your current role, um, you know, the client side today ain't what it used to be in terms of, you know, it used to be that you commission research, you receive results on the back end. Now, you know, it's very easy to to get a corporate, you know, Qualtrics account, um, conduct yes. some some surveys yourself, do, do some DIY, um, and those abilities do help to just if you're on the corporate side to be able to dabble in you know some of these more you know nuts and bolts elements right yes yeah you know i mean certainly you know um having diy tools and you know democratizing data and, and having dashboards and easy access you know in some ways it makes our job easier right because of you know budgets or to be able to you know turn something around quickly or to have you know easier access um, but in some ways, you still need to package it. And, and I think that that that's the end thing. So yes, it's great to be able to, you know, put a survey out quickly. It's great to get, you know, video commentary. It's great to, um, you know, sort of, again, have sort of major access to information like we never had before. Um, but the still challenge is I'm dealing with, you know, marketing and product and, and um, you know, people from various roles and insights isn't their background and understanding data isn't their background. They're like, I need to make X, Y, Z decision. So those tools really help us at least get that information quicker, but there's still the, you know, the packaging of how do I figure out how to present the information that meets their learning style? What are the three takeaways that they really need? And also, with research and insights is how do I make sure that um, A, I have their back because I'm support, like I'm, you know, supporting them, but B, how do I put it in a way that they're gonna understand? Because if I show numbers, I kind of alluded this, numbers are one thing, percents are another thing, quotes are powerful, video is powerful, or even just a visual and, you know, these are the three steps. Um, you know, just takes it to another level, which really needs to happen because, you know, they can't spend their time being immersed. They're trusting us that we've sort of immersed ourselves in the story. And they're saying, I have XYZ issue. What do I do about it <laughs> based on what you found? And not only that, but how does that research effort or that insight fit into some other things that, you know, that they're doing or they might know? And how do we make sure that it, you know, aligns? And if it's contradictory, which sometimes it is, posing it in the right way so we don't, you know, off put them, but we sort of say, here was another perspective um, and here's how it fits with what you know. Well, and it goes back to the Tyler's presentation earlier today and the bureaucracy and, and the politics of research. I mean, that's yes. you, you, <laughs> what better place than the corporate side to, to learn all these things. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, I do recommend if you're a young researcher, I, I want you to bookmark this <laughs> this webinar, this is really good stuff and very, very impactful. And even if you've been at it for a while, it's, uh, you know, so, some really good stuff shared here. Um, listen, I think that does it for the Q and A. Just one last quick check. Yeah, I think you, uh, you did it. <laughs> Congratulations. <Okay. laughs> um, just a couple of real quick housekeeping items. Um, we are gonna be uh, posting all of the videos from today and, and archiving them. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Should have those up um, in the next day or two. Uh, again, mark your calendars for, for March 25th, which will be our next, uh, our next conference installment. Um, 
And that's it. Jason, appreciate it. Thank you for closing us out today. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, and thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, this was great. Uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.